Okay, so how many of you have answered busy when someone asks how you're doing? Yeah, that's it's a thing that I used to do a lot. I'm doing a little bit less. I'm working on doing a little bit less. Uh, but it's kind of a hard habit to break. Our culture glorifies being busy. And so our ability to like endlessly labor, to hustle all day every day is something that we're expected to take pride in. And Stanford sociologists have actually identified uh, what they call the ideal worker. And so the ideal worker is someone who works 40 hours a week or more, preferably more, without interruption until retirement, uh, devoting most of their time and energy to work. They are always available and they prioritize work above everything else. I'm not an ideal worker. <laughs> Um, I, I learned the hard way that working all the time and ignoring you know, my needs is not a lifestyle that I can sustain. And it cost me my health and I spent a lot of years recovering from that. So I have Lyme disease, which, with a Y, um, it's ranged anywhere from annoying all the way up to you know, debilitating for me personally. And self-care is essential for everyone, so don't think I'm not talking to you if you don't have like a health thing that you're dealing with. but. Uh, as a professional sick person, I learned through my bad decisions that it's really non-negotiable for someone with a chronic health condition. So when I first got sick, uh, I thought I can just kind of like will my way through it. And you know, a lot of you probably had the same thing when you're trying to get to a deadline. You just keep pushing and your body will like catch up somehow probably. And you know, none of my doctors knew what was going on anyway, so I figured that probably everyone else just felt like garbage too, and they managed you know, to have jobs and full social lives, and so I got to be very much about that hustle. And, you know, I worked a full-time job, uh, I was starting a business, I did an accelerated grad school program, I got mono somehow, I ended up so sick that I slept for 22 hours in a row, and I spent any time that I wasn't working not moving <laughs> on the couch. So it turns out that all that hustling might not actually be great for you. But we're obsessed with busy. And we live in a culture that you know facilitates it. Modern communication makes it really easy to just always be on. And there used to be a really an easy physical barrier to working all the time. It was called an office, and you would leave it. Uh, but now, you know, your office is anywhere, anytime. You have email and Wi-Fi and Slack and Trello and texting and social media, and there's just no such thing as I missed your call anymore. Since you can always be accessible, you're expected to always be accessible. But is anyone actually benefiting? from all these extra hours that we're working. It turns out uh, that the best employees are ha happy, healthy, and well-rested. Go figure. Your brain needs downtime to function. Um, employees are definitely not benefiting from all these extra hours. And we know this, but you know we treat rest like a sin and sleep as something that we can conquer with coffee or just completely ignore. You know, we say, like, I'll sleep when I'm dead. Like, giving up sleep is a point of pride for people, uh, but it's really just being cruel to your body. Healthy sleep is one of the very best things that you can do as preventative medicine to, to take care of yourself. And one night of sleep deprivation, which they qualify as less than six hours, so some of us are maybe in a little more trouble than we thought, uh, one night makes you more susceptible to illness and infection. And longer term, it, you know, messes up your short and long-term memory formation, decision-making, attention, um, concentration. Your brain needs that uh, distance, you know, and the time away to do complex work. And my friend Jeremy helped me make this point on Twitter, so I asked him if I could use these. Um, he was working on solving a problem, took a step back from it, and ta-da, solved the problem. And this is how your brain works, really. It runs these background processes while you're doing other things, like you know, looking at corgis or whatever. So stepping away, it helps you recover from mental fatigue and you're more effective when you come back to it. You end up wasting less time overall if you just take the break when you need it. Um, you know, I, I know I've been calling over, you know, coworkers and things and saying something like, oh, can you help me with this design? I've just been staring at it for too long. Like I probably would have spent less time overall if I just took a break when I should have, when I got burned out. So we're not benefiting from extra hours. Uh, but like our bosses must be, right? Because why else would we be doing this? Actually, most of the extra hours we're working are just for show. So productivity drops pretty steeply after 50, 50 hours, but after 55, it drops off a cliff. Uh, it's a thing economists call a productivity cliff. And I don't have the chart for the day-to-day the -day work, but I think it's right around 10 or 11 hours that you just tank. So. A lot of employees are working, you know, an extra 10 or 20 hours a week and not getting any more work done. Um, 
I think our, our average salaried work week is 49 hours, and 25% of us work more than 60. So 25% of us are putting in extra time for, for almost no reason. And it turns out, to, probably to no one's surprise, that exhausted workers are more prone to accidents and errors. So you're actually kind of negative working when you figure for all the time you have to go back and fix the things that you messed up when you were overtired. Uh, Harvard Business Review did a study at a consulting firm and found uh, that employees there were pretending to work an 80-hour week because they said that you know to, to succeed there, you have to be this ideal worker and always on, uh, but they hated it. So they actually worked less hours and um, just didn't tell anybody. And we're still praised for the great work that they were doing. So, you know, what does that tell you? That some people are shady about their work practices? Yeah, you should definitely not pad your timesheet, lie to your boss, it's bad. That's not the takeaway from this at all. Um, but it also tells us that even in client services where, you know, bosses and supervisors will tell you that you just have to be accessible all the time, it's not really the case that, you know, you, you can achieve the metrics that value, uh, that matter to your company and still secretly be working reasonable hours. Uh, so it's, it's a thing that's possible to do. I think this skipped a thing. We'll go with this. So, <laughs> so we're ruining our health and we're missing out on our own lives and our bosses are getting shoddy work and everyone's miserable. Why are we doing this? For one thing, we're rewarded for it. Um, leaders who have made personal sacrifices of their own time or health find it hard to believe that there's another way to do it, even when they're confronted with evidence of it. So even with all this like, you know, solid research from, from well-vetted institutions that say that you're wasting these hours, we still feel like that's a metric of success. We still feel like we're being successful because we're doing so much all the time. And um, People that succeed in these kind of environments are praised and they're given promotions, even where, like in other countries where people actually take their vacation, uh, they'd be chastised for being inefficient. So, busy is no longer a complaint that we make. It's, you know, it's a point of pride. It's a thing that people brag about. And, um, you know, keeping that pace is kind of an adrenaline rush. And if you're this busy, you must also be very important. And we don't even honestly value what you're doing so long as you are doing a lot consistently. Um, and so we're confusing basic self-care like rest with, with laziness. The idea of uh, a virtuous person as a, a working person goes back uh, to the ancient Greeks. Uh, Protestants, you know, kind of have that uh, idea of, a, you know, the Protestant work ethic you've probably heard of that the only way to get into heaven is to always be working. And even like in cartoons like Thomas the Tank Engine, where the only good train is a useful train, like you see this over and over. So it's kind of no wonder that when people curate their social media existence, they're so focused on this like hashtag hustling. But the thing is, chronic overwork is, is not a, a point of pride, it's a failure of project management. And you know, you're equating busy with productive and choosing quantity over quality and valuing hustle over living a healthy life. And so rest, instead of becoming a passive thing, is an act of resistance. So let's resist. That mostly worked. Um, ideal workers don't take care of themselves. Healthy workers do. So this is kind of my like too long didn't read on self-care. And if you get literally nothing else out of this, I hope that it's this one slide, which got a little weird, but we can still read it. Um, <laughs> Self-care does not make you lazy. It doesn't make you weak or indulgent or selfish or bad employee. It makes you a person with needs. And taking care of yourself in, you know, in the right way makes you a happier, healthier human and also a better employee. So it's really better for everyone that you're taking better care of yourself. For everyone, um, well, so, so self-care can take a lot of different forms. It might be, uh, you know, maybe you're fil filtering your social media feed of things that give you anxiety with no benefit, which feels really relevant to me lately. Um, it maybe it's asking for help, either you know from friends or family, or in formal ways like checking out your employee assistance program or taking a medical leave, that kind of thing. And or it's you know finding things that bring you joy, and they can be small things and easy to accomplish things. It doesn't have to be jetting off to Fiji, although that sounds real nice. Uh, but for everyone, just basic minimal. Self-care, uh, eating enough, sleeping enough, moving your body in a way that makes you happy, things that I should not have to, to tell you. 
uh, you know, just basic care is important. And I know that they're important because I, for a while, was not doing any of them. I was, you know, keeping up appearances and I wouldn't admit that I needed more rest and couldn't pull all-nighters or, you know, live off of Dorito tacos or whatever and still function like my friends were doing, that I, I needed, you know, more self-care. But I was ignoring that. And, um, but eventually, you know, I, I got better. I found a treatment plan that worked. Um, and I learned absolutely nothing at all about taking care of myself in that time. I took that as an opportunity to work nonstop. I had a full-time job. I started a photo business. I was easily pulling 60 hours a week. I shot on the weekends. I was pretty much never not working to the point that like I had to set an alarm to remind me to eat lunch. That was a thing I was forgetting. Food. Uh, so I was pushing too hard and then I would push myself even harder instead of that cycle I'd been doing before of pushing too hard and crashing. But the hours have to come from somewhere. So, you know, I wasn't getting any sleep or exercise or any of the things that keep my immune system from just giving me the finger and walking out. And so a year later, I was sick again. And in fact, I was much sicker the second time. And since I, you know, need to see a specialist and I live in the middle of nowhere, that meant like a five hour round trip every month to see this doctor. And so I couldn't hide my illness from the people that I work with anymore because you know, I, I didn't even have enough leave to cover the doctor's appointments, let alone all the other nonsense that goes along with being a sick person. So that was the part where I finally learned about self-care. And the thing is, taking care of, of yourself, taking care of your health is important. It's, it's your health and this stuff is serious and it matters. There was, uh, this has been a couple of years ago, an Indonesian girl literally worked herself to death. Um, a combination of not sleeping and pounding energy drinks to stay awake, you know, all the while tweeting about how much she loves that grind, killed her. And it's not common, it's an, it's an extreme example, but she's also not the only person that this has ever happened to. Uh, the stuff matters. Caring for your brain and for your body matters. And the work you do can be a huge part of who you are, but it's still a part, and it's a part that you can't do if you don't look after yourself. Uh, so when we get overwhelmed, uh, when we get stressed, we let the things that are easiest to overlook slip. And self-care is really, really easy to overlook. It's an easy thing to shuffle to the bottom of your to-do list and, and not get to. And we leave ourselves as the last lowest priority and we suffer for it. Your body is not the enemy. And that's the thing to keep in mind. It's working very hard to support all of the things that you're doing. Um, and it deserves a little compassion from you. So, you know, you want to give your brain and your body the resources that they need for your work, for your life, uh, for your creative process, for all, all of the things that you're doing and not just your job. But because you're busy and we're all really, really busy, it feels like, you know, maybe you don't have time to concern yourself with self-care. But the thing is, your immune system gets wrecked by bad diet and no sleep and too much work. And eventually it is going to catch up with you. Something's got to give. And for the most part, you spend more time wasted being sick than if you had just taken the time to take care of yourself in the first place. I had a baby last year, which is mostly just an excuse to show you cute photos. Um, but so once or twice a day, the little guy wants to sit with me for like 10 minutes. It's a really, really small request. And most of the things, you know, that would help you out are small requests, like remembering to eat lunch or going to bed at a reasonable hour or taking a walk for 10 minutes or something. They're small. It's just tiny little bits of self-care. And I learned that I can either give him the thing that he needs that helps him be a tiny person in a world that's still kind of new to him, or we can all suffer. And, you know, I can keep trying to work, uh, you know, writing or, or photo editing or whatever, while he clings to my legs and cries, and I'm stressed because he's upset, he's stressed because he's not getting the thing he needs, but to my point, I end up having to go and sit with him you know, I, I, I spend twice as long doing this thing while my blood pressure creeps up and then we still have to go sit down and get each other calm and happy like he wanted to do in the first place. Um, instead of just, you know, taking that time, we're now making this take longer. And it's a thing that I should have learned back in grad school when I would skip lunch to work on my thesis and end up sleepy and hangry and ineffective at doing the thing that I'm trying to do. So the thing is you can do most any task faster and more efficiently and more happily if you keep yourself in a good you know, condition to do it. But the thing is, like, you know this, you're, you're grown-ups, you know you need lunch, 
you know, that's not a thing I have to tell you. You know what's best for you and how to take care of yourself. The trick then is in, in making the time to do it. And I don't say finding the time because I have never just stumbled upon a magical pocket of free time that was like gifted to me. Here is 20 minutes, do whatever you want. Like, you're, you know, you make decisions about how you're spending your time. Uh, and it's one thing to say you should take care of yourself and live your life to the fullest, you know, while you can. And there's inspirational tumblers about it. Very inspirational. Um, but many of us either want to work or have to work. Um, so it's a matter of making time to both do the work and still take care of yourself. This, by the way, there's an entire Tumblr that's just Skeletor inspirational memes, if you need that in your life, which I did. Uh, all right. So the first step in, uh, is admitting that you have a problem, right? The second step is telling people that you have a problem. So when you're working from home with a kid, uh, it's really easy, yeah, to get wrapped up in parenting Instagram. So, you know, you have the Pinterest worthy parties and the bento box lunches and just precious, shining, clean children. Uh, and seeing all that all day makes you think that you must be doing it wrong with your filthy kid eating a corn cob with no pants. Like that's, you must be messing this up. But then, you know, Jennifer Daniels tweets about her kid poking on her patio. And so then you're like, okay, this doesn't just happen to me. It's other people too. So, yeah, <laughs> in the same way, kind of, uh, seeing people post about, you know, their long hours and how much they love that hustle and they wake up, rise and grind and whatever, makes you think that you're doing it wrong, that, you know, you who need sleep and food to function, uh, you who are able to recognize that you work better if your anxiety levels are down, you who knows that you can't pull all-nighters and actually schedules your work in a realistic way so you have time for breaks and vacations and dog petting or whatever. Our culture makes you think that you're doing it wrong. So, you know, I'm up here to tell you that I need that stuff too. Uh, breaks and vacations and dog petting. I, you know, you can be successful and still do all of those things. I, uh, I work for myself. I'm our kid's primary caregiver. I still make time to, for self-care. It, it is possible and necessary. And so much of this culture is implicit that, you know, actually explicitly stating your needs uh, and your concerns can really start to change your workplace. And it can help normalize policy changes for other people. So when my husband was looking at, you know, taking leave when we had our kid, he talked to other guys at work who had done that. And, you know, it helps to get uh, a gauge of what the company's actually okay with, which can be in some places worlds apart from what's offered or what you're even legally entitled to. So, you know, you taking more leave encourages other people to do it, and you actually using your vacation time encourages other people to do it. Talking about your needs encourages other people to do it. You're setting up, a, you know, a, 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 an environment where that's okay. And speaking up helps, you know, to let the people that you work for know what matters to you. Uh, Bright Horizons did a study, and they found that fathers stress over work-life balance more than college savings or career advancement, which were two things they assumed that they cared about much more. So they actually found two things in the study. One, that dad stressed over work-life balance, and two, that they did not know that. Um, your, you know, your boss can't help you if they don't actually realize that there's a problem. They had been assuming these other things were a higher priority to their workers, and they were wrong. And many employers are so afraid of saying or doing the wrong thing that they won't do anything when they see that an employee is struggling. They don't you know, want to invade your privacy. They don't want to make things worse for you. Um, but you can open up that conversation uh, and, and you can, you know, work on how you can better do your job in, in that environment. Um, ideal workers do not have boundaries at all. Healthy workers have boundaries. Um, there's no right, like one right way to fight for this at work. It's, it's very situational and how much you can afford to push back is totally tied to how much you need this job, how you think your, you know, employee's going to take it, um, you know, how they've handled other employees with similar requests. There's a lot of really glib advice to just like quit your job if it's not the most perfect thing in the world and it's not really helpful or practical for anybody. You know, maybe you need that job or maybe you just really like that job except for this one thing about it that you would, you know, rather kind of work on to improve. So I can't, you know, stand here and say that there aren't any risks to rocking the boat. There are, but uh, setting healthy boundaries is a really important step to fighting burnout. <coughs> I used to work at a place that everyone kind of like ate lunch at their desks and just worked through lunch. That was just sort of the culture there. 
And eventually, you know, one of my coworkers just said, I'm gonna take a walk, anyone else wanna go? And then we became an office who took lunch walks. Like that was it, that was all that it took was one person standing up and saying, hey, I kind of need to get out of this joint for like a minute. Sometimes that's all it takes. Sometimes you have to fight a little bit harder for it. This guy's kind of long. I want to be friends with that guy. Right. <laughs> He's done. He's done working now. <laughs> yes, I am. <laughs> so, yeah, there... There is lots of room, though, between begrudgingly just accepting that your work is slowly killing you and rolling and singing, take this job and shove it. Like, there's a lot, a lot of space in between there. Um, so there's degrees of rebellion. You know, you might rebel in small ways, like being a person who suggests a lunch walk, and that's, you know, you're probably not going to get called into the office for insubordination for that. It's pretty minor, as boat rocking goes. Um, you know, you might, might rebel in slightly bigger ways, like not answering email at midnight or uh, by setting work hours at all. When, you know, a lot of people that freelance or work off-site just don't really have business hours of any kind. It's a thing we don't tend to enforce. And it's an implicit boundary that we're setting with our behavior. You condition people on what availability to expect from you. So, you know, if you respond immediately to an email at 10 p.m. on a Sunday, you're saying, I am fine with this. Please continue sending me emails at all hours of the day. I enjoy it very much. You know, they, they come to expect that availability from you because you were giving them that availability. And now that you can work from anywhere, anytime, it's more important to set boundaries or else you will end up working from everywhere all the time. I did um, contract work for a university uh, that's not this one, but that I'm also not going to name. Uh, and I was working hours that I was not getting paid for. And it wasn't just me, it was like the whole team was doing this. And, you know, for my mental and physical well being, I had to cut that out. So it was a boundary that I needed to set. And I gave them some warning because, you know, when you are saying all of a sudden, hey, this is a problem for me, even though I've been doing it a couple of weeks, uh, you know, it's important to kind of communicate with them that way. And so at the time, I was only working part time for them. I did 20 hours. So when I hit 15 hours, I was, you know, hey, I, I already worked 15. I only have five left. That's it. To warn them. And, um, you know, oftentimes they'd have more work than they could actually afford for me to do. And they would kind of ask if I couldn't just, you know, like, do it anyway. And so you're tempted to, to explain yourself, like, oh, you know, I can't, I have this other job, I have uh, appointments, I have whatever excuse thing that you have, you know, that you can't do this. And the, the best trick that I learned for saying no to things is to stop at no. Don't say, no, I don't have a ride, because then they'll just offer you a ride, and then you have to come up with some other reason that you can't do the thing. Yes. Say no, stop talking. <laughs> It's tricky, but it works. Um, you know, so yeah, I would tell them, you know, I'm sorry, I work my hours, they're up, that's it. And I had a time tracker, I could show them where they'd all gone. And yeah, my boss was not thrilled with that because who wants to lose a bunch of free labor? But, you know, she understood that I don't want to work hours that I'm not getting paid for. That's not unreasonable. Um, you don't know how your company will necessarily react and that's where pushing against boundaries can get tricky. And, you know, sometimes even if they're not responding in overt ways, uh, you know, people, have all heard of that that happening where you get penalized in subtle ways like passed over for promotions uh you know big jobs raises things like that so it's tricky but on the other hand you might find that they're really amenable to changes and you have been just like killing yourself to work within parameters that they don't even care about the first internship that i did i could either get there five minutes late or 30 minutes early so i got there early and months into this i finally mentioned it to one of my supervisors and he's like why didn't you say just come in five minutes late who cares like, I've been going nuts to get in there early, um, and they, they don't even care. So it's possible, you know, that you push back against these boundaries and find that they're, they're totally okay with it. So there can be risks to doing it, but there can also be real benefits. And setting boundaries due to, to illness, whether you have a physical or a mental issue, can add layers of difficulty to it. Um, you know, you might not speak up because you're uncomfortable talking about your health. Uh, maybe you don't know how to answer their questions. I don't know if I'm going to be better. I don't, I don't know how this is going to affect me. Health issues can get really kind of heavy uh, to talk about. Uh, but the thing is, it can also, you want to take into account how stressful it's going to be for you to hide this from people. Like when you're struggling and you basically are, are having to live a double life so that the people you work with don't find out, it's incredibly stressful. And of course, that stress is also really bad for your health. So you're kind of making a mess there. So you, you need to be mindful of the risks, but not utterly paralyzed by, by caution there. And, and if you can't push back, 
if it's not a thing that you can achieve, if it's not, if they don't offer those accommodations or can't help you, it's important to still try to find that support through family or friends or outside agencies or support groups or somewhere that can kind of help you out getting through, you know, making that job work for you. You have to really weigh the benefits of speaking up against the risks. Now, for me, like I said, I didn't have enough leave time to even do my doctor's appointment. So I, I basically was looking at either talk to the people I work with or get fired for not being at work nearly enough. So I didn't really have anything to lose in that equation. Uh, so for me, the, uh, the hard part was admitting that I needed that help. And I needed it in a pretty formal way, you know, to avoid getting fired. So I filed for partial FMLA leave. Setting this whole business up is sort of outside of my scope for today, uh, but you can come see me after if it's a thing you have to deal with. Um, and there's also a lot of, help. I googled sample scripts and things that can help you get started on it. But the thing is that, as with any of these boundaries that you're setting, the important thing, the important steps are, one, you have to get really super duper clear about what you need uh, and realistic about you know what you need to keep doing your job while still allowing you to be a healthy person outside of work. The second step is to ask for it and not feel guilty about it, which is hard. So some of the problem with us kind of working ourselves into the ground is, um, is external. You know, if you're working for someone else, you're working on their schedule. Some of it's us. You know, I, one of my worst work habits that I had to work really hard to stop doing was to feel this constant crushing guilt any time that I wasn't working on a project to get it done. Uh, and feeling that is exhausting. So even when I was, you know, spending my downtime I was actually just drowning in anxiety over not working, so it's you know, kind of pointless to have that downtime in the first place. Because uh, I felt guilty about being unproductive. So I, you know, I'd work a ton, and then I'd feel burned out, so then I'd be lazy and play video games, and then I'd feel bad about that, so then I'd work too much, and it's just like a cycle that kind of loops. So how do you combat that? Um, the first step is in figuring out what work is even worth doing. And I'm a big list person. I have to-do lists for my business, for our household, for our kid, for this talk that I'm giving right now. Like, I love lists. And, but I still find that there are things that find their way onto my to-do list that do not belong there. And um, I found this chart. I'm sorry, I have paper notes like a caveman. Uh, that I actually used uh, in my book. This says shameless plug on it. I have a book out, and it's $10, and you can get it from me today if you're interested, and it has... Uh, the information that would have been in the punk rock entrepreneur talk that was supposed to be later today. <clears throat> anyway, so this chart that I put in my book, uh, it's called an Eisenhower box, and it's a way to prioritize your to-do list. Uh, you sort things into urgent or not and important or not. First thing, this bottom right box is gone. Um, this is where busy lives because you're doing stuff. You're doing lots and lots of stuff, but none of it's actually important stuff that's getting you where you want to go. Uh, so that never think about it again. Just delete it right now. Uh, the top left gets done right now. These are fires that you need to put out. Uh, and then the other two boxes are for planning. You're either delegating things or you're finding a home on your to-do list because if you don't make time for it, it just keeps slipping and never gets done. Self-care gets put in one of these top two boxes depending on how badly you've been putting it off. All right. Um, so one of the ways that you can kind of reclaim some of your time is to get more efficient at working. But the trick to this is uh, not to fill the time with more work. So, you know, you're, you're finding ways to, whether it's like a Pomodoro technique or you're using systems that help you with recurring tasks that you can automate. I have programmer friends that have, I think his cutoff is something like, if it takes me more than 30 minutes a month, then it's worth the time to write a program to do it instead. So, you know, finding those recurring systems or even focusing on monotasking. We're so used to doing a million things at once. Um, and multitasking, scientifically speaking, isn't even really a thing. You're just switching back between tasks really quickly. Multitasking is an El Camino. Like, it's supposed to be a car and a truck, but instead it's just really bad at both of those things. Super inefficient. But however you do it, the point is that you want to maximize the time that you spend working so you can spend less time working. That's the important takeaway that people often miss with this. Um, it's a sprinter's tactic. You can't keep that up long term, you know, without getting burned out. And you can always find more work to do and spend another two hours at the office on something that could have waited until tomorrow, but eventually you hit diminishing returns on that and you can't run anymore. Neither can this guy. So you need to find ways to give yourself permission to be done. Um, <laughs> it's terrible, the things that happen. So my work hours now are really limited. I have a part-time schedule 
and um, you know, I figured out how many hours a week. <laughs> he just keeps going. Uh, how many hours a week I can actually, you know, spend on working. And so my to-do list has time estimates. Like I said, I do time tracking, so I know how long this stuff takes. Um, all right. So <laughs> this is my actual calendar that I really probably should have edited before I just put it up here. But um, but this is how I track my time. I, I you know put one hour blocks. And when my time's up, when I did that work, I know that I'm done. I can clock out. I did the hour that I scheduled. Knowing that I'm on pace to complete a project as long as I'm hitting those small you know, deadlines, it keeps me from getting that anxiety that used to drive me to just plow through a thing every second I had until it was done. Like I, I know that I can stop. And you know, before my time was limited by like how long my kid naps, um, I used to do that with lists, uh, with, um, yeah, with like subtasks on lists, I would pick you know, three things that needed to be done that day. When those things were done, I would declare myself victorious and play video games or watch Netflix or whatever. Um, it's weird to think that being like overly scheduled and organized would help me to be less stressed, but it's a thing that works for me. Uh, a friend of mine instituted Film Fridays. Um, I think he used to teach her actually. So that was his like permission to, every Friday he got to work on all his personal projects that were not, you know, getting done because they were getting lost in the to-do list. So whatever it is, you know, that works for you, Find the thing that makes you feel like you've done enough for the day so that you can clock out without feeling guilty about it. I had to continually like reevaluate this. It changed when I got sick, it changed when I relapsed, it changed again when I had a son. I'm sure it will change a thousand more times. Um, it's a thing that you always have to be looking at. But you know, when your work is important to you, and I've always thought of my work as like, you know, a big part of my identity, you want to do the best job that you can of it. And to do that, you have to realistically assess what you need to do it. Um, you know, identify the things that you need to thrive in all the areas of your life because your life is about more than just work. And so I'm not just, you know, defining success for me in terms of how my business is doing, but how the, all the other areas of my life are doing as well. And life is about balancing for everybody. You have to figure out, you know, what it is do I have to give up to get what I need. Since uh, I've been in remission this time, I actually learned how important it is to take care of myself, uh, how taking on more work and running myself into the ground sets me up for years hooked up to IV poles and taking so many pills that I had to organize them in a tackle box. Uh, the second time I got sick, the time that I should have known better and should have done better, you know, to keep, to help prevent that from happening, I was sick for five years. And yeah, I didn't cause that to happen to me. That's not how illness works, but I did make it worse by refusing to slow down. So, you know, the next time you're bragging about your 60 hour work week or how much you love that hustle and never ever quit, consider for a minute what you might be giving up. Thank you. That's all I got. Um, so I don't know if these things are doing like Q and A's or <laughs> whatever. So if you have any questions, I don't have anywhere to be. I do not have a podcast. I you need a podcast. Yeah, I talk a lot. I talk enough to have a podcast yeah. for sure. Well, this is a big <laughs> topic. Yeah, it's it's one. Um, I did this talk at Open Source and Feelings in Seattle last month, uh, which is a tech conference. So a lot of the dev jokes were over my head. Uh, they made a lot of JavaScript jokes I didn't get, but it seems <laughs> to be like a pervasive thing that the people in this and in the tech community especially, it seems to be really bad. You know. I just keep crashing friends I, I podcasts, use, so if you want me to crash your podcast, I totally will. So I use OmniList to create, or OmniFocus to create task lists. Mm -hmm. And what I end up finding is I try to create like this little task for every little thing that needs to get done, work and personal, and then I can't prioritize them mm -hmm. because the priorities change every single day. And then I can't figure out which one to start on first. And then I spend half the day trying to figure out which direction I'm turning in. Yeah, that's, Have you ever, yeah, like, that, that's a big problem. Because I used to just keep, this? I had like a monster to-do list that had everything. Yeah. All, like stuff that I need to do tomorrow, stuff I need to do six months from now, stuff that needed done and for work, for business, for whatever. Like it's, yeah, it's huge. And then you just look and you're like, eh, I'm just going to watch Netflix. I'm done. Yes. I can't with this. And yeah, I actually I read uh, another wedding photographer 
that had this her like three things to win the day. That's where I got that from. And that's what she would do is in the evening before uh, like the end of your day, your work day for the next day, she would list. These are the three things that I want to get done tomorrow. And that's it. And if I get those three things done, then I win and I'm great. Like you get to pat yourself on the back and, and feel good about like you accomplished the things you set out to do. Can a shower be one of those? Yes. Things? Yeah, yeah. Put shower on your I'm list, man. Too. I've yeah. Oh God, really? Yeah. I our kid's scared of the shower, so I can only shower whenever someone else is home to watch him because he like won't be in the same room with me. So that's yeah. Shower goes on the list. Yeah, one, one suggestion for omnipotent users is for you to check out Tim Stringer's videos and specifically on perspectives. So okay. so like the tool itself provides you with a function for doing that. Yeah, so, I've been told to use perspectives, but I have yet to actually understand perspectives right. yet. Uh, Tim Stringer does a really, Tim really Stringer. great job of explaining how OmniFocus 2 works in that regard, and I think that that will really help you define and then be able to use the tool better. Okay, great. And that, that's not one I've used. I use, I think it's any.do because it has a, a mobile version and it connects to the web version so I can connect it wherever. I used um, that for a little bit. Yeah, that one has a, a scheduling thing, so you can, like I can still, if I don't write a thing down, then it's in my brain and I'm anxious that it's in my brain, it's, I'm gonna forget it. So I, I have to write down those bigger goals that need done three months, six months, a year from now, whatever. I have to write them down and get them out of my brain. So that allows me to put in like a date for that. Like, oh, I need to do yeah. this, but not until, like don't even show me this until September, but it's right. on the list and I can like mentally, you know, check it off or whatever. Yeah, so if that's a thing, that if it lets you do any kind focused, of scheduling. But I have a hard time seeing past this week. Yeah, well that's, yeah, some, so. sometimes that's the best you can do is just plan this week, you know? <laughs> and, and then you have the like, when I get a minute list. And like I said, I've, I started using that, that sort of box to kind of make sure that Things that were important weren't slipping because if you do the if you do the short view if you're not taking a long view of your schedule, then you end up doing the the busy things that are like oh this is busy work that I have to to get done because they're urgent but they're not important so I think that helped me a lot to kind of when I felt like I just had a big mess of unprioritized overwhelming nonsense then that that kind of helped me to to figure out what I should be working on. Yeah. Um, sure. So my strategy Yeah, I've read some, I can't remember the analogy for the life of me. It's something to do with eating a frog. I don't know if anyone, that, what is it? Frog. Yeah, so that's the basic idea is like whatever's the most like, oh, I don't want to do this today. Do it first, get it done, and then and then you can feel happy. Although I have been guilty of like, I have put small things on my list that I can know, that I know I can get done just so that I can cross it off and feel good about myself. So I've done that. Like I get that you get that little rush of like, yeah, check that off. I'm doing good. But yeah, mo most people seem to think that, that the best way to go about it is to, to get that, like, the thing you don't want to do out of the way first. Because I, you, you will totally, uh, I have a friend that calls it pro procrastinating working. Because you're doing stuff, but you're not doing the stuff that you're supposed to be doing. But you're doing stuff. So that's, you can kind of fall into that, like, getting the little easy things and never getting to that, yeah. the important one. And then the easy stuff is kind of a reward. So like, yeah. Let's make it through this, and I'll get to do yeah, this easy thing that takes no brain work. Yeah. Yeah, and I also, for, for people that have trouble determining what to do that day, and moms, yeah, because uh, I have house stuff, I have kids stuff, I have work stuff, I have, you know, I have a lot of different buckets of stuff, and um, I've talked to people that, that theme their days, so like Mondays they do email admin stuff, Tuesdays they do meetings, Wednesdays they do uh, house stuff, whatever it is that you can kind of like, so that you don't have to spend so much mental energy on like, oh, what do I work on today? Oh, it's Wednesday, I do house stuff, you know, and then you don't have to, to spend all that time kind of figuring out, because that's, you know, you don't want to spend an hour at the beginning of your day just figuring out what you're even doing that day. Like that's, right. exhaust you before you even start doing any real work and you get worn out on that. What did you do today? Well, I've done that. I worked at a job where I was just micromanaged. And basically by the end of the day, all I did was write down 
what I was going to do if I was not writing down what I was doing. I had a job that kept timesheets in five minute increments and I'm like, when would I even get work done? I'm just writing down that I'm writing down the work that I'm not doing. <laughs> like it's, that's a little too micromanagey. Do you have a preferred to-do list I've been I've been using the Any.do that works for me, yeah. but I it, there are a jillion like yeah. to-do apps, and I've tried a lot of them, and I've tried paper ones, and I've tried web ones, and whatever, and I think it just is a matter of trying a bunch of different stuff until you see what sticks for you personally. Because I have people that swear up and down by other apps, and like that, I don't know, I just I never looked at it, or you know, yeah. I used to keep a whiteboard with a very small font that made my husband nervous. Like that used to be, my, he's like, the smaller the font gets, the busier you are, and that concerns me. <laughs> so that, like, that used to be my method was just whiteboard that I could look at all the time, and I, I finally found a digital thing that works for me personally. Yeah, I'm laughing because I, I use one called Todoist, and I love it because it's a Gmail extension, so you can take an email and say, follow up on this. Week. Oh, yeah, I use and an inbox as a to do list. And as I look at this, I see where I have 10 over. Yeah, so it's not really working. <laughs> yeah, that's, I, I, I do that. Did you have another? Yeah. Um, so my other question is, what if, like, so I like what I do. So, like, I like to do it. I know I work way too much, though. And I'm, like, always sleepy. I get, like, four hours of sleep, five hours of sleep. And, like, but I like doing the stuff I'm doing, actually. So, yeah. So, like, what? So, that, like, what, you know what I mean? It makes it hard when your work is also your hobby. Like, your work is also... Because I do photography. I love it. Like, I, a lot of it I don't love. There's... Uh, I tell people I feel like getting a college major is just picking what you want to answer email about until you die. Like, that's... Because 90% of my job is just email. That part's boring. But the work part, like the editing and the shooting and that stuff, love it. Um, but even if you love a thing, you still can get burned out on doing it. So it's still... It's harder to set aside that time, but it's really, really necessary to be like, okay, I know this is super fun, uh, and, I, and I could do this all night, but, like, I need to not do this all night. So it's, you know, setting up systems, like I said, uh, declaring a done point for me has been really, really important. Because the other thing is when you work from home, and you can work any time at all, my office is just right there, um, you know, you fall into that, like, oh, I'll just check an email real quick at 9 o'clock. Oh, I'll just, I mean, it's midnight, but, like, I could just, I could probably get this done, I'll just work another hour, like having to, to, to kind of enforce like hard cutoff points with myself and to give myself business hours, even though I don't have to have them, like that's been really helpful to me just to step back from it. And, you know, making time for personal projects that, you know, what is it, what do you do? Um, by trade, so I'm doing so like the death, the okay. you're talking about your friend does. It is easy to be like this, like yeah. constantly, but. Yeah, because there's always something else you could be doing. Yeah. So, but it's yeah. I think it's really important to find a, a cutoff for it, especially if it's something you love. Because if I've worked jobs that the only thing I got out of it was a paycheck. So when my when it's four o'clock, I'm leaving. Like I have no other reason to be here. I hate it here. I'm here because you're paying me money. That's it. But when you're doing something that you really love to do, then yeah, there's there's another reason that you're you're doing that work, and it's harder for you to shut it off. <laughs> I'm listening to what you're doing. Okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, this is my last one, though. Um, so, I actually want to ask you, and I also want to ask you, mm -hmm. so, um, when you were talking about saying no, I find that women, specifically, have mm -hmm. a very hard time. Because people like you more when you say yes to yeah, things. we don't want to be not liked, and we don't want to be a B, and, like, yeah. you know, consider, you know, when a guy does it, like when a guy is aggressive, he's called a boss. When a girl's aggressive, she's called a bee. Yeah. And so I just want to know, like, is it true? Like, do our men just like, no, I'm not doing that, you know, and just leave it at that? Or do men kind of feel like they have to make an excuse too? Men can be sissies too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Are you scared of confrontation also? Right? Yeah. So, no, I think no, that I men, mean, by and large, say yes as a, as a practice of male culture, you know, being we need to be able to show ourselves as strong yeah. and powerful and blah, blah, blah. And it's just, you know, it's all part of misogyny, bad mm -hmm. stuff that's still remnant yeah. culture that needs to yeah. die. We will so, fall on the sword just so that the, the project people, yeah. can get done. Yeah, but remember that, like, your job is to, to do what's best for you, yeah. not do what's best for society. So, you know, not always. I think we should have some philanthropic note, but <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> not everything. You can't, I, I do have a small addendum to the no and stop talking. If what they're asking of you is something that someone else at your office should be doing, that someone else does better. 
Uh, you can make a no but. So you're still saying no, I'm still not doing this, but I can help you get this thing done that you need to get done. Because I, cons I will have people you know, that email me, oh, we have an event coming up, can you shoot it? I, I don't do that, That's uh, it's a thing I used to do. I do weddings and portrait stuff, I don't do events anymore. So no, but I have a friend that does and I can refer you to them and set you up with the information to get in touch with them. So you can be helpful and still not be doing the thing that you don't wanna do. <laughs> it's sneaky, uh, but, it, but it works. Okay. Does anyone else have any other uh, excellent suggestions for <laughs> for time tracking or? Okay. Right. Why are they only sick when it's snowing? Yeah. <laughs> or, or when the weather's really good, you know. Right. So I don't know what, what you can say about that. It's, it's really tricky, and it's, it's a thing that people bring up a lot about, like, you know, welfare reform and things like that, that, yeah, you will have people that take advantage of a system, but, you know, does that mean that you don't offer it to the people that do legitimately need it, that are making good use of it, that are using it like they're supposed to? It's, so it's really, because it, it's hard. It's hard to, to tell somebody whether or not they're too sick to work, whether or not their parents too, you know, it, it's not like a situation you can kind of insert yourself into without kind of knowing what, what their situation really is. So yeah, that, that is the, the downside to any kind of program that's helping people is that you will have jerks that take advantage of it. Uh, but yeah, I, I still feel like, I don't know, that's not a reason to not, to not offer it or to not support people that do need it because man, I needed it. <laughs> I was hired at Lipson when I was four months pregnant. I was actually laid off from my prior job when I was three months pregnant <laughs> and um, was hired by Lipson. And the problem with that was they're a very small company, so their leave requirements are minimal. And I wasn't going to be there for a full year to have the advantage of being able to take FMLA. Uh, so I had to take leave unpaid in order to be home with my child when he was born. So I actually worked with Larry, the president of our company, um, when I was hired on what the solution was going to be and what the long-term solution was going to be. And ultimately, through constant communication and her seeing how I did on the job and um, so on and so forth, what ultimately ended up happening was it turned into a full-time work from home situation for me. So I think it depends on the person, it depends on if the quality of work that you're putting forth is actually worth the company's time. I mean, if you're not good at what you're, if you're not actually putting forth the work, then why are they going to work with you? But even when FM, FMLA is not accessible uh, for a company who has worthwhile management talking to them can really help in those situations. Yeah, it's, um, it, you know, it's even, like you said, some places don't, uh, some, some people may not be covered by FMLA, it's only for companies of a certain size, if you've worked there for a year, like there are a lot of stipulations to it. But there are even things like, I, I had a friend that had, uh, they were able to telecommute, they could work from home uh, until one dude was not actually working from home. He was just being at home and getting paid for it. So then, yeah, he just ruined it, you know, for everybody. Now no one's allowed to telecommute because that one guy can't, like, manage his time well uh, and is trying to take advantage of a company. So that, that happens. But, um, yeah, the place that I was at, actually, when I got pregnant was uh, we had, like, six people that worked there. So it's very small. So they're legally, they don't owe me anything. I was a contract worker. It's a small place. They didn't have to do anything at all for me. Um, but when I asked my boss about it, when I talked about doing maternity leave, he's like, uh, that's never come up. Like, they've just never had a pregnant employee. It's a small place and that, you know, so you may run into situations where you speaking up is like, this is the first time this has happened. And that might help them out in the future with like, oh, well, now we do have a policy because somebody actually, you know, needed it. Yeah, <laughs> but it was a weird, weird situation. From home options for other members of the team. We have some people that maybe take one day a week and work from home. 
We brought on Dave, who is yeah. 100% work from home now. Yeah, see, um, some people actually still get their work done if they're at home. Well, so. we do provide reports at the end of the day of what it is that we do, so management knows, and they can always go in and check to see if we're telling the truth mm -hmm. on, on what we're doing. So it's not that we're not doing our jobs, but it, it did open some things up. But then I ended up with the situation of I work from home, so I never leave work. And <laughs> yeah, boundaries. <laughs> Is your book available on Kindle? Uh, the if you order it through Microcosm site, they have the ebook. Amazon, for whatever reason, only has a physical book. Uh, so I, I think I, I auto tweeted a from Hootsuite a link while I was talking here. <laughs> so I think it's on my Twitter uh, that they have the ebook. What's your book called? It's Punk Rock Entrepreneur. Uh, it looks like this. Ta da! Yeah, thank you. I drew it myself. Um, so this was this was the first conference talk I ever gave that ended up turning into a book, and it was how I learned to run a business from DIY punk kids. So if you're you know running a small business, maybe of interest to you.